And here it is. This is the big one. This is set 10316, The Lord of the Rings Rivendell, which released in March of 2023 for 850 NZD, 6,167 pieces and 15 minifigures if we exclude the special statues, but 21 if you do include those. That's pretty cool. This is a very expensive set, but the scale of this thing is just unmatched in my collection, filled with exquisite details unlike any other LEGO set that I've seen before. I think Rivendell might be coming for the Quickie Mart's crown honestly. What took me the entire length of the theatrical release of the trilogy, plus a quick watch of an unexpected journey, meant that this was roughly 12 or so hours long of building over the course of around two days. 49 numbered bags of pieces total and a building experience that I just completely adored. The return of one of my favorite themes meant a lot to me. I am a Kiwi after all. Let's not waste any time here and just get straight into it. The build is easily separated into three different sections, and this is achieved through the use of Technic pegs. In fact, the set is barely connected to begin with at all rather the parts just sit next to each other and use the pegs as a guideline. We start with the tower here which is the first thing that you build when you begin this journey. It's actually a really great easy way to start this build, taking me the entirety of the Fellowship of the Ring to complete and it gives you a pretty good introduction towards the main hall which will take up the bulk of the build. I loved building the architecture here, like this contrast between the stone wall reminiscent of my favourite medieval fantasy games and movies and the interior space that reminded me of how good the castle theme works in the LEGO format. You also get some nice practice preparation for the roof, which I think is everyone's biggest fear when it comes to the set. The first thing I want to point out here at the base is the foliage, which was brand new for 2023, and it first released here in this set. I do believe now that these parts have made their way into plenty of other sets released throughout the year, so we've already come a little used to them by now, but you do get so many of them here and they all look marvellous. Right here we have a small little hidden access way, which has enough space to fit a hobbit inside for snooping. Directly above you, you have some statues which overlook the area. These being minifigures is a really special extra extra bonus and I can see these figures of stone being useful in other creations, like if you're trying to make some custom Dune Part 2 minifigures. The only differences between the lot here are one or two different hair pieces used and either legs or dress pieces, five of them wrap around the sides here. The way that they're connected onto the build is also different depending on the lower half legs used. Our dress piece figures are attached by studs underneath, while the legged figures are attached with studs behind their legs. I really loved putting this whole thing together. These archways are made by use of bone tusk parts and the tiles for the steps make the scenery feel rather elegant. I especially love the contrast of that brick yellow to the grey stones for the tower. At the back here, we have nothing too special really, just an entryway for us to look inside, but it looks more complete here once everything has been connected all together. We can take a look at the interior for the first floor now, which features a nice little seating area or a desk of some kind, and a bookshelf at the back, which uses some differing bricks to show the uniqueness of each book on the shelf. Moving upwards and backwards here to the exterior, but also somewhat the interior, it's an interior once it's all been placed together, we have a small little balcony section with a stickered mural depicting the prologue of the story, Sauron appearing in minifig form battling Isildur. Above that we have some nice detailing to make this look all fancy like. And moving around to the side here we have a really nice looking balcony section with the candlestick pieces being used as support beams for our roof section. The tower continues the nice architecture of the statues build with the grey stone and curvature pieces here. Sand green is used a lot in the set and it looks gorgeous when it all comes together. This is a few of the few roofs that you will build using this method of perfectly lining up these tiles on their sides here. This looks like build as hell, especially when you see the entire thing put together, but it's actually made pretty simple in the instructions. You're actually given little clear indicators to show you the perfect method of how to line these up, simply by using a plate and running it through the gaps there. They also make sure that there's always a plate nearby in the build for you to be using. It looks very solid, very ornate in its design, but this does mean that dusting the set is going to be an issue in the future when you're trying to get it cleaned inside the image between sections here. There's a small clip up here at the top of the roof which connects into the other building to help hold it in place. And the roof is held together through use of these pegs which are attached here and here. Our last section for the exterior here is the tower itself, which uses some more great stone-like design and sand green for the roof sections. A hobbit can fit in here, but you won't really be able to pose them or anything. The section also isn't exactly built to be interacted with, which I demonstrate here by trying to remove some of these pieces. The tower does actually come away from just below that little section. This whole chunk can be removed and it allows us to have a bit of an easier access to inside that desk and 
working area of the room. We can see inside that this is where Bilbo is writing his book. The book is actually attached to a clip so that it can stay perfectly in place on the desk, and the book has a sticker on the front of it as well. We have a little chair and a bed which is where Frodo is shown to be resting when he wakes up in Rivendell for the first time. This is also where a small chest is located with Sting and a stickered print of Bilbo's mithril armour that he gives to Frodo which I think looks excellent. The minifigures that you get to build from this section are Frodo, Bilbo and Samwise Gamgee and that's it for our tower build. Like I said, I'm really impressed with how this set opens up, and even better, now we get to build something completely different. We now move on to the River, Forge, and Armory, which is our second instruction manual, and offers some new design methods that help bulk out the scenery, rather than adding to the main building. This part of the build took me the entire length of the two towers, and while it does take a little while longer to get going since most of the build is just adding to some rock foundations, the intricacies were still really impressive to help keep me engaged all throughout. This in of itself makes for a really nice build which feels like it could be used as a stand for any of your other favourite medieval fantasy worlds. We start with the river here which uses a lot of translucent blues of course, but I also love the attention of detail in using white bricks for foam of the rapids and rock parts to help show the uneven surfaces. More of this detailing can be seen to occur by the cliffside here at the back which also uses some nice plant life parts to help bulk out that cliffside. There's more smooth parts here used for steps and a bridge, the steps are placed on their sides here with a few studs at the top for minifigures to stand on. We start getting some more of the plant life here with the first unique tree design of the set. Using varied colours for the leaves, this tree has greens and golds while the other one uses yellows and orange for a rather autumn feeling. The tree is just connected by a Technic peg here and it's placed firmly in its section. I love building armories in Lego and this was a great one to sink my teeth into. Here we have an anvil and some tools in the barrel there and some studs and clear pieces to look like kindling and flames in the furnace area. The overgrown roots are also a nice touch just to really show you how old this place is. The most eye-catching thing here is the gazebo of course, which was really fun to put together, though the thin parts this set uses do make it feel quite fragile. Using parts like vines and life preservers and skeleton arms and teeth to make that structure of the roof section there. The whole gazebo can be removed from the scene very easily, it's genuinely just sitting in place there, and removing it gives you access to the inside of the armory. You need to to realign these corners into the corners of the build in order to connect it again and that's how it's kept so secured in its place. Our armory interior is pretty minimal actually. There's quite a lot of room for minifigures to stand around inside here and we have two weapon racks each with a bunch of unique brand new exclusive elements but we'll get into that later on. There's also a working table here as well. Next to the armory is the backside of water with some more greenage landscaping and a small little toad. The minifigures that you get for this build are Arwen, an unnamed dwarf, an unnamed elf, and Gimli. The River Forge and Armory was again a really nice building experience that gave me something new, but it's now time to move on to the biggest chunk of the build, which is the Council Ring and Halls. This chunk of the build is massive, and it really did take up the bulk of the time and parts used. Half of the bags in the set are dedicated to just this one segment of the build, which took me the entire length of both Return of the King and an unexpected journey back to back. This seemed like it would be the most daunting part of the build with the extended roof sections and an even deeper foundational build, more ornate details and an even bigger design tree build, but it's really impressive overall with how much went into this segment alone, and it really brings together the unique techniques that we've learnt from building both the tower and the forge, and it combines them for one really great grand finale. Starting off rather easy, we'll start with our last parts of greens and yellows for the foliage here, which do surround the outer layer of the build, and seeing all of these new elements together really brings that scene home for me. We have a smaller gazebo-like build here which features a table on the inside with what appears to be Lambus bread sitting at that table there. This is also one of those sections that's not very interactable, the roof just stays put there and it's a bit crammed on the inside to have many figures standing here. Behind that section is a nice little bench for a hobbit to be resting, and here we have the thinnest tree of the set but it's covered in leaves and tucked away in this little corner. The tree behind it is also thin but not nearly as thin as this one and it doesn't have any leaves until the top half here, which features this really beautiful design of a bunch of leaves all bundled together. This tree is also connected to the walls of the set through use of these Technic pegs. The other side features more murals to look at. This is Celebrimbor forging the rings of power, but there's nothing much else going on here. Up top is where the clip from our tower connects into, and here are your shots of this beautiful ornate roof piece. This giant chunk up top takes a lot of your time building, using the same build methods and colours as the last roof build, but it's almost doubled in its scale, and connected very firmly in place through use of these rods here. We will spin this set around and take a look at the inside of the halls here. There's a few study areas with some desks and designs of maps and parchment all around the room. This one here that features a map of what appears 
appears to be Mordor is located near a staircase that leads to the second floor. Up here we have a very thin balcony with a statue and some artworks. The artworks here are all stickers depicting the scenes of a hidden city of Gondolin and then Arendelle's ship. It's very nice to see. We also have a statue here which is holding onto the shattered remains of Narsil, though the other pieces aren't included in the set, just the main handle. It looks really great to see and the statue is just directly holding onto the sword here instead of holding onto the display as seen in the movie. Some more maps and other items around the main foyer here and look at these tiles. The tile patterns look really great and they use many of these pieces here to help cover the entire grounds. The big tree out front uses all the techniques from the other trees that we've built and it stands as the base handle for the council ring. This is the final part of the build you get to make and it makes for a really good final segment. The chairs are brought to life using hot dogs and popsicles of all things. The plinth in the middle is much more defined here than the first time that we saw this scene in Lego and it includes a spare one ring so you can have it resting here on the stud. The entire section is fully removable actually using the same methods as the gazebo from earlier. It just sits atop these bricks here. Underneath I love the inclusion of the eye appearing as the foundational support. A nice little reference for those paying attention. This alone probably could have been enough to satisfy fans and I'm really happy that something like this can be separate so that we can have a detailed more focus on build. It feels very sturdy and I can only imagine that this was an absolute pain to try and figure out how to make it easily slotted back into place and fit perfectly in the structure. Just like the gazebo, you need to line up those corners to help fit it back into place again. Some final parts here to show off is that gorgeous tall tree and this little tower segment which isn't big enough to fit a minifigure inside, it just makes for some nice looking decoration. The final minifigures we get in this build are probably the best of the bunch. We have another unnamed elf, Elrond, Gandalf here up top, and then down below we have Merry, Pippin, Boromir, Legolas, and Aragorn. Connecting this set all together just means lining up those Technic pegs and sitting each build next to one another like so. It's really easy to move the set around for your displays then. This thing is simply fantastic and it's no wonder it was collectively considered the best Lego set to release of 2023. It's now time to take a look at each of those individual minifigures which I think is the real reason that everyone is excited and interested in the Lord of the Rings themes return. We've had a few remakes over the years of some of Lego's older themes so how did these figures live up as modern iterations? This is Bilbo who is appearing to us as the old man form for the first time ever in Lego. Ian Holm uses the dark brown hairpiece which I think works really well for him, the only hobbit to not have the special hobbit hairpiece. He does feature exclusive details in the head and torso and the hobbit legs are now dual molded to show off their feet for the first time in Lego. He has a double sided face of a transfixed look which is cool to see but the eyes kind of throw it off a little for me, a little disappointed that he doesn't have a happier resting expression either. Here he is compared to the most popular variant of him, this version of Bilbo released in a few different sets over the theme's lifespan so it's not really a remake here. This is Frodo who was one of my all time favourite minifigures in the original line, something that I might end up saying a few times in this video actually. Frodo here looks exactly how I remembered him looking back in 2012 which is funny because he definitely looks different once we get to the comparisons. Like Bilbo he features dual moulding in his legs, nice coat torso and a green cape because this is based on Fellowship of the Ring so the cape appears green here. He does have back printing detailing and a double sided face which features an expression of him being stabbed. This was used a few times on the original Frodo minifigures. Comparing him to the other Fellowship of the Ring release from Weathertop, we can see some key differences here, like Lego have removed all that stress from his face, where he looked like he was just so worn out already and it was only day one of his journey. I think the new face is excellent at capturing how he looks in that first movie. All of the torso designs are very interesting in this set because they all have the modern day designs but it's streamlined and it feels a little bit less detailed. I felt that the Indiana Jones sets from last year did this as well, and just about every remake here features similar designs like this, where it definitely still has the same features from the 2012 figures but it also feels like it has a little bit less going on. I think I've seen some mixed feelings on the minifigures overall from people and I have to say I think I understand. This is Sam who is a pretty good improvement in my eyes. Sam features a Sam blue cape compared to Frodo and he wields a frying pan as his accessory which was something that I actually gave to my original Sam figure back when I first got that set as well. Something else that Lego have done here is changed his hair colour where he originally had more of a blonde hair piece, here he sports more of a reddish hair piece. I think both do work for him, double sided face print and back printing as well, and exclusive prints mind you. Here he is compared to his original variant. In my eyes he appears to be one of the more obvious updates. 
face printing seems to be pretty similar, but the torso is completely different this time round, and this could be due to the fact that Sam was only ever released in one set, and it was based on Return of the King, so essentially you're getting two different Samwise Gamgee figures at completely different stages of the journey here. Mary was another figure that I was really excited about getting because he too seemed very different from his past iteration. Like Sam, they've changed the hair pieces around this time, and now Mary has a blonde hair piece over the red one that he originally had, like the greens used on the torso and the cape there as well, and he also includes a carrot as an accessory. His face print that's double-sided to feature an expression of a greater smile, which is very different to the angered look that he had in the original, is tragically not an exclusive print, appearing in the Harry Potter line first, but speaking of originals, here he is compared to the Weathertop variant. The obvious change here is that hairpiece and the colours on the torso seem to have swapped over in terms of brightness to darkness, brighter yellow, darker greens. Our final Hobbit companion here is Pippin, who thankfully also looks like a really good solid remake. He wears a brown cape compared to the others, and showcases an almost clueless expression with his blue shirt torso. Double-sided face that is exclusive to the set, we're back to exclusive face prints now, that's good, and it features Pippin smiling. He also includes the elvish bread as his accessory as well, and here he is compared to that original figure, and like we've said, they've taken the same design but they've toned down on the details. His scarf isn't curving anymore, it just simply drops down, waistcoat isn't slightly creasing and exposing more undershirt, it's basically the whole side details. It's an interesting figure overall. This is Gimli, who I am just floored by on the technicals and the remake scale. He is easily one of the best standout figures for me. Gimli now stands on the midi scale legs, which makes him taller than a hobbit, but still shorter than an elf. This is also the first time that Gimli has been given a hairpiece, and I think it all looks really great altogether. His helmet is a different detailed design to the original, with more emphasis on the golds here. He's just perfect. Here he is without the extra beard and hair covering details. You can see that he doesn't have a double-sided expression, which was something that I always thought was interesting about the original figure, because you could never really tell the difference between the prints once the helmet and beard were attached. He also uses a brand new piece for his axe, which has been made specifically for this set. Here he is compared to his original figure, it's one of the best LEGO remakes I've ever seen I think. Aragorn is another really nice looking remake, partly for that torso and legs, which now match Aragorn's design a little bit better in my eyes. The only Aragorn that we ever got besides the final battle variant was the Strider figure, and he was used in every single set looking like that. It's something new, which is really nice to see. Aragorn here uses the classic hairpiece, which was first given to us as the Dastan hairpiece from the Prince of Persia line. He now also features an exclusive minifigure face print with a new sword element as well. His face print is double-sided to show a more angered and determined expression, and maybe it's a good thing that we have this kind of a variant, and not one that's a bit more ornate and appropriate for the meeting like as seen in the movie, because this way you can just remove the figure from the scene and display the fellowship separately if you would like in any other scenario that you wish. Here he is compared to his Weathertop variant, we have a design change and a colour change which helps to make a brand new fresh take. Let's now take a look at a controversial figure inclusion. This is Legolas, who, like all of the other elves released in the set, uses the same new special hairpiece mold that is made just for them, just like how he released in 2012. I love the dual molding on the legs there, and the torso looks really great as well, finally getting those colours correct. The original had a pale blue and lighter toned green, so this immediately looks great to me. The hairpiece is interesting, I'll say at the very least. I think it works really well for most of the other elves, but it doesn't really work for Legolas for me here. I see what they were going for here with the two strands, but it just doesn't work. It's a bit too thick and too far back up at the top there. Removing that hairpiece we can see the details on his back, and again we have another Legolas minifigure who can't use a quiver piece. I had hopes that they would have made a special hairpiece, one that was moulded in, or one that could still be used with a quiver piece or something, because it's pretty integral towards Legolas I think. The face print is not an exclusive one either, it's just Han Solo, which is really disappointing to see. Compared to the 2012 variant, the big biggest difference here are the colours and the difference of face prints. No chiselled look on this guy here, and it feels really distracting to me. This is Boromir, who is another excellent remake, and probably the best figure of the set really. We have such a good design going on for him here compared to that original release. Boromir has a great torso print that continues onto the legs there, and he also has a new shield and sword piece as well. Brown cape with an exclusive face print featuring a double-sided expression and some back printing as well. He's one of my favourites of the set, and compared to his original release, Boromir just looks like night and day. The hair colouring, the details, the torso design, the weapons, it is a complete immaculate minifigure. This is Gandalf who was another one of my all-time favourite
many figures, and this figure is so close to being perfect in my eyes. Gandalf uses a hairpiece here, which we have seen in the past, it's from the Harry Potter ones, I believe it's Dumbledore's new hairpiece. And the biggest difference here is the use of the dress piece, completely changes the figure for me. I think that this is just excellent, but this is also something that I'm a little bummed out by. The no hair hat combo piece is tiresome at this point. It works for Gimli, yes, it doesn't really work for Gandalf here. This is something that I can't wait to see change in the future because long hair and the grey wizard hat would make this figure perfect. Gandalf doesn't use an exclusive face print either, instead he uses one from the Jurassic World Ken Wheatley face, it's something that I complained about in my Jurassic World Mansion review, but they had to use a face without a double sided expression because they didn't want to give him a hair hat combo piece. Here he is compared to the original, again, the amount of changes made onto this figure, like the dress piece is just insane to me. Another great standout remake. This is the unnamed dwarf that is clearly supposed to be Gloin, there will be a reason behind why he isn't named anywhere here on the box or on the website or anything, but we'll just call him Gloin from now on because it's a bit easier for me to say. Gloin here looks really good before you remove that beard, he has an exclusive face print which is really surprising to see on an unnamed character like this, but underneath the beard he's got the Chris Pratt torso from the Jurassic World line which just feels incredibly cheap to me. Gloin did appear in a set before this actually, the same way that Bilbo did in the Hobbit line, so technically it's not a remake to the same capacity as the other ones that we've seen, but I thought I would just show off the comparison anyway. This is Elrond who is definitely a standout figure for me here as well. Elrond has his crown printed into his head this time round, which means that Lego can get to reuse the same hairpiece and not have to worry about it. I think his expressions are really great, I think the dress piece is also really nice to see in red, with more ornate designs going on here. He does miss his cape this time around compared to the original, but that's the price that you pay for details like this I suppose. Double sided expression to show a bit more of an accurate Hugo Weaving face. And compared to the original release, like I said, the crown and the cape and the legs are the biggest differences here, but also the colours interestingly enough. Arwen is also here in the set, appearing in clothes that are a bit more accurate to how she appears in the movie this time around, and using her father's hairpiece as well. The dress looks pretty good with some unique details, but the face print I'm not really a fan of. I don't think the Tina Goldstein face print here works for Liv Tyler, double sided to have an annoyed expression, which also isn't really in character I would say, and here she is compared to the original release figure, and this is another very obvious clear update. The clothes are different and the colours are too, the hairpiece, the expression, everything is fresh on her hair. That leaves our two unnamed elves as the last figures here to look at. Female and male elves both use the exact same torso and leg pieces, and they both feature the same hairpiece, one of them using Legolas's and the other one using Elrond's. They both have double-sided expressions to show their genuine feelings about working at Rivendell, because the faces are reused from other sets. The male is Shang-Chi and Draco Malfoy, and the female is Pepper Potts and Hermione Granger. Superheroes and Harry Potter are Lego's bread and butter these days. Here's a quick look at the statues all removed from their posts. There is back detailing and double-sided expressions for these statues which allows you a little bit of customizing. The face prints are just slight variants of resting faces though, it's really cool to have these figures included in the set and honestly, like I said, these parts will be useful for other themes in the future. The last few mentions here are the extra accessories. As you can see, Elrond can't sit down in his chair and that means that neither can Gandalf or any of the hobbits because their specific legs don't allow for bends. Lego have actually included these extras which is a game changer in my eyes. We have a printed brick for the dress like characters and brick built legs for the hobbits. Swapping them over is very easy and now we can have our Elrond and Gandalf seated at the meeting and the hobbits legs are easy as well, just two bricks that imitate the little Lego legs and they can now be seated at the seats or at the bridge. I'm really impressed that they decided to go this far with their details and their designs, and I hope to see these items in future sets for other themes. The last thing to showcase here are the special weapons that they made just for the set. You get extras of all of them included. Boromir's sword, Aragorn's sword, Narsil, Sting, the Elvish blades, and Gimli's axes. These are all amazing pieces, and I hope to see them cross over into other themes in the future. The instructions for the set were printed into three different booklets. Each booklet, while not being numbered, did have its parts of the build highlighted on the front cover. Really, you're free to build this in whatever order you like, and you can also build this with multiple people. Inside our instruction manual, we open to a blurb that welcomes us and a quick description of the set. We then have a page dedicated to the designers who brought this beautiful idea to life. Flipping the page on the other side, we have a small look at the sets that released originally during the two waves from 2012 to 2013. And in each booklet, we have a small description of the section of Rivendell that you're about to start building, and a small highlight point on just some of the figures included in the segment. After that, it's a standard LEGO instruction book 
booklet with an image of the set complete at the end and our inventory list. Our first instruction manual sits at 175 pages long. As for the second booklet, we open to a nice description of the River Forge and Armory and a look at Arwen and Gimli. Then it becomes our standard instruction manuals on the inside and at the back, we have just still images of the build after it's all come together. Total amount of pages in this booklet is 163 pages. Then in our last booklet, which is the biggest of the three, we open to a page that details the council ring and some quick briefings on Boromir, Elrond, Merry, and Pippin. Then it's the same old instruction manuals, but at the back we have a page for some step-by-step -step instructions on how to build and apply the special seated legs for our characters. Our final instruction manual here is a whopping 331 pages long. All in all, 669 pages of instructions. The box is that fancy but boring black adult looking box because the set does cost more than a week's worth of rent. We have a nice detailed look at the product on the front with our minifigures displayed around the side here as well. Our figures also appear on the top lid, but without their names underneath. The side view shows us the set from the gazebo's angle, and the back of the box here also shows us some good angles of the interior design and some up-close images of the features as well. We have this image of the set that can break apart easily as well as the dimensions of the display. These images here which show us the council forming and Gandalf meeting with a recovering Frodo. We can see Boromir interacting with the sealed door's ear, and Bilbo is finishing his book. And the final image we have here are the elves that are slaving away at the forge. And that is Rivendell, one of LEGO's best achievements and a set that I imagine will be here for a very long time for people. I think that the set is fantastic and one that I adore completely. To see a theme that I love so much return like this is both exciting and a little disappointing if I'm honest. I would have loved to have seen a new wave of smaller play sets for others to be able to get because the price point to have the entire fellowship in brand new updated forms, it's a bit too much for me. No current word on whether or not we'll be getting more from the theme anytime soon either unfortunately. We were all burned on no Indiana Jones returning for 2024, I wouldn't be surprised if Lord of the Rings does follow a similar path unfortunately. But fingers crossed we get to see some actual playsets. I would highly recommend the set to people especially if you missed out on the theme last time. All of the figures here are at least interesting in their new portrayals, some of them are definitely better than the 2012 counterparts. I hope to see more from the line in the future but if not, I am happy that I was able to build this masterpiece. If you enjoyed this look at the Lego Lord of the Rings Rivendell set, liking the video and subscribing to the channel here does help to support us in making more longer videos like this one. Kakete I hope to see you in the next review.